Joining us now is Adam Ketachu. She is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Chicago and author of World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination. Adam, uh, thank you so much for returning to the show. Thank you for having me, Michael. So let's start. This is just a few. This is about a 40 second montage of Michael Manley, who is a kind of iconic Jamaican prime minister. He served in the 70s and the late 80s and early 90s with very different political profiles. Uh, this is from a time when he was a leader uh, in this third world project that you've documented so well in this book. And I just want to give people, I guess, a sense of manly, but maybe also some of the sense of the sort of bro broader uh, focus of this project. So we're going to play about 40 seconds of this, and then, Adam, I'll throw to you. Okay, great. You say now, why are we taking this risk to anger the United States of America? And the answer is this, we are not angering the United States of America, they are angering themselves. They are not going to tell me what relationship I have with Fidel Castro. We have that friendship with Cuba as part of a world alliance of third world nations that are fighting for justice for poor people in the world. And I tell you as the party leader, as long as this party is in power, we intend to walk through the world on our feet and not on our knees. Hi, Dom. Uh, what's going on there and how do those clips, I mean, I, I picked this for a reason, obviously, I feel like it really reflects what you have documented in terms of the decolonization process and the types of leaders in the Caribbean, Africa, Latin America that emerged. Yeah, great. Um, it's a great clip to start with, partly because it stages one of the most, interve most important interventions that Michael Manley and others would make which is to recast uh, the terms of the post-war, post-World War II divide in terms of a global North and global South, right? So Manley in that brief um, clip we heard pits himself against the United States in solidarity with Cuba. And he makes this argument that this solidarity with Cuba is about a struggle for justice for pure, poor peoples around the world. So. What he does in this moment, as he would do in other moments of his political career, is recast the Cold War divide, is resist and reject the Cold War divide of East and West to center a North-South divide of kind of uh, former colonies and a North Atlantic world that benefited directly from, from the imperial project. So what I try to do in the broader book project is um, look at uh, African and Caribbean um, intellectuals and statesmen uh, beginning uh, after World War II and into the 1970s who would make this argument that decolonization, uh, the achievement of self-determination, required really transforming the relations of uh, political, economic, and legal relations between global North and global South. So that's what we hear Michael Manley staging in that brief clip for us. And you also make the point that this process of decolonization, in contrast to the sort, because it's sort of like absorbed history that, like, oh, well, through some sort of combination of like maybe, oh, there was a little bit of activism, but also it was sort of like, you know, the em these European empires were kind of like winding down and there was this transition in the global system. So there was like, an inevitability to decolonization, whereas you're actually really recentering the fact that this was incredibly radical, it was not uh, inevitable at all, and it also, po even though, and correct me if I'm wrong, obviously there's more receptivity in the Soviet Union than in the United States to these movements, but it still challenges both sides of that equation because it, it is saying like we want to exist out of the superpower, like, dynamic. Yes, yes, that's right. So one of the big interventions the book tries to make is to challenge the kind of received reading of decolonization as a straightforward, inevitable transition between empire, from a world of empires to one of nation states. So there's a variety of ways that our narrative captures this. So as other historians have pointed out, 
the very term decolonization was actually coined by European intellectuals um, to sort of uh, make it appear as if, like, rather than marking the defeat of empire, decolonization was just the straightforward culmination of, of, of the imperial project. So they would never have to kind of assume the posture of defeat, right? Um, and a second place maybe we can see this is, say, in the language of um, uh, UK Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who would say uh, the wind of change is blowing over Africa, right? And so here, too, we see a kind of naturalistic metaphor to describe this process as if it were inevitable and as if it wasn't very disruptive also, as if it wasn't transformative. Um, so Nkrumah would have two different, I'm going to switch to Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana to, to show you a little bit how even in the language they use, the set of actors challenged this naturalistic uh, metaphors uh, that kind of made it appear as if decolonization was inevitable. So in his... Um, in his 1965 neocolonialism, uh, Nkrumah would kind of lament the fact that decolonization had just been reduced to this, what he called um, a transfer of sovereignty from colonialist to African, African statesmen, right? Mm -hmm. And he would say, mm -hmm. in response to Harold, Her Harold McMillan's wind of change, that decolonization is a hurricane um, that's kind of radically disrupting and tearing down all the bastions of colonialism. He said it could only occur in a revolutionary framework, right? And so um, this kind of, ra like I argue that decolonization was really a radical rupture. Uh, it, was a, it was a kind of an assault on the, on the post-war war settlement. Um, so something like the right to self-determination emerges in the UN context after 15 years of struggle, right, um, in which, you know, European imperial powers actively resisted the effort to include a right to self-determination within the human rights covenants we get in the 1960s. Um, another mo 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 moment of struggle where Manly would be actually very important um, would be the effort to get a new international economic order in the 1970s. So these projects were real challenges um, to the kind of post-war international order that the United States had worked to build. Um, and I think what, you're say, what you say about the Soviet Union is quite right. I mean, in many ways, the Soviet Union was an important strategic ally of, of, um, of the, of the uh, post-decolonization project, uh, would vote in favor of the various, uh, sometimes co-sponsor some of this um, um, like resolutions in the UN say that we're putting forward the right to self-determination. But I do think it's important to think of the project that anti-colonial leaders are engaged in as, as really a kind of attempt to sketch out an alternative trajectory. And this stems in part from an earlier moment, an earlier 1930s uh, moment of, of the kind of limits and failures of the communist international. So during the interwar period, a number of, of black, um, black anti-colonials were deeply involved in the communist international and saw themselves as, as um, you know, saw that as the forum and the space in which this project of decolonization would take place. So one person that's really important in that story is the Trinidadian um, uh, uh, Marxist, uh, George Padmore, who would then go on to be an advisor to Kwame Nkrumah. So part of what happens in the 1930s is, I, is the Soviet Union increasingly abandons the kind of communist international model, um, it, the space for anti-colonial thinkers to use that that context for their own struggles gets, um, um, you know, closed. Uh, there's a lot of a purge that um, kind of forces George Padmore and other black communists out. So there's a real sense um, after the war that we need to create a different kind of a black international, if you will, an anti-colonial international that, uh, that, that doesn't abandon Marxism and, and, um, but but seeks to think about a different, a kind of alternative sp spaces and forums to the communist international. So that's interesting because, it, yeah, so it still is trying to synthesize like 
the global Marxist project, but then account for the specific failings of the Soviet Union and the specific challenges of Africa as an example. But on the other hand, this also predates like, I mean, you know, like uh, on on a on a on a like a leader like Tabo Mbeki, right, would come much later on, obviously, and in some ways, mm -hmm. I think be really intellectually influenced by the leaders you're talking about. And he also was a you know was certainly kind of like you know very historically minded leader. Uh, and then his African mm -hmm. Renaissance, though, very clearly was like economically totally within the 1990s global capitalist order, but it had like a very specific uh, rhetoric and idea of like cultural liberation. Um, but in this yeah. case, you're talking like, this is still like a synthesis of both of those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think many of the thinkers I deal with are very much um, influenced uh, by Marxist thinking, um, by by the by the Russian Revolution, I mean that becomes an exemplary model that that kind of shows what might be possible. Um, so um, after World War One, W. E. B. Du Bois would say the one good thing that came out of this war is the Bolshevik Revolution, which okay. showed to the world that the real democracy means democracy of the working people. And then he kind of makes this claim that what will carry this revolutionary project forward is the, you know, colonial working class, right? The working classes of the world. Um, and you see that, you know, that, that kind of, um, the inheritance of a kind of, um, um, yeah, kind of a Marxist project, a communist project, it gets reformulated, but it persists. And one of the things, a series of, uh, Black Marxists would be very importantly try to do beginning in the interwar period is to try to trace out the specific trajectories of kind of of uh, of the economies of these colonial societies, right? The mechanisms by which colonialism produces divergent trajectories, um, forms of colonial dependence. Uh, um, you know, transforms peasant peasant life, etc. So that's the, what part of their the argument is that we have to think about um, economic transformation in in um, uh, like in, in in the specificity of these particular contexts. The second mm -hmm. um, part of this project, I think, uh, one thing you know, again, taking a, 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 a the Marxist insight of a kind of the global character of late of of capital seriously um, is to try in a, to to think with this idea of an international division of labor and to imagine the colonial world itself as the working classes of the world. So uh, again, going back to the clip which we, we opened with, part of what Manley is saying when he says we have this like global alliance with Cuba is this argument he and others would develop in the 70s that imagine the whole world as in some ways a factory shop, right? A factory floor. And imagine that Cuba and Tanzania and, and Jamaica and these societies actually fun functioned as the working classes of the, of the global economy. So imagining class solidarity as a form of third world solidarity by the 1970s. I mean, what's interesting, I think... Um, and you're mentioning of Tabo Mbeki, and um, so it indicates this already. And you, as you as you alluded to in your opening too, that Manley's um, later transformation when he comes back into into the into office after the 1980s, um, uh, you can see the ways in which uh, the, also again how this project is tied to the Soviet Union or how the right. Soviet Union's presence made possible these kind of radical imaginings. Um, the failure, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the triumph of a kind of neoliberalism uh, in the late 80s uh, really transforms the conditions in which um, of what is possible. Um, so by the time Manley re enters, returns to office, or by the time South Africa, you know, the ANC um, overcomes apartheid in 1994, 
the terms of the debate have significantly narrowed, right? Um, mm-hmm. The sense of political possibility is much smaller in that period than it had been in the 30 years prior. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing and get that content out there. Subscribe below.